All right. So our next speaker is Kathleen Ting, and she's going to speak about seven deadly Hadoop misconfigurations. Thank you. Fault tolerant hardware is expensive. Hadoop is a framework for processing and querying big data on cheap commodity hardware that automatically handles data replication node failure. From two years of supporting diverse clusters, I've learned firsthand a lot of um, a lot of misconfigurations that can break clusters. So misconfigurations and bugs break the most clusters. Fixing misconfigurations is up to you. And what I, what I want to share during this talk is what I've learned uh, over the past two years of supporting clusters. What are the most common misconfigurations we see that have broken clusters? <coughs> I am a Scoop committer and PMC member. And following this talk, I will be speaking with Arvind Prabhakar on Scoop as well, uh, where we'll talk about Scoop too. Um, I work at Cloudera as a customer operations engineering manager. And the manager uh, role at Cloudera is more of a player coach model. So in addition to the people management responsibilities, I also work a lot of the support issues. Um, and I'm a subject matter expert um, on, on MapReduce, on Zookeeper, Flume, Scoop. Um, and the bulk of, of this talk is, is from the past two years of supporting clusters day in and day out and just seeing some of the, the common themes, speci specifically around miscommunication, miscommunication, misconfiguration uh, with memory, disk, and threads. For those of you not familiar with, um, with MapReduce or with Hadoop, um, the best way to explain MapReduce is with an example, and the best example is the word count example. So word count is the hello world of Hadoop. It's the, the, the example you run um, to, to make sure your cluster is configured correctly. Um, I will say, though, that even if word count succeeds, that doesn't automatically guarantee that your cluster is completely configured correctly. Often, a, a somewhat innocuous change will break your cluster, but your cluster was um, misconfigured from the beginning, but word count, um, you know, isn't meant to test the, the robustness and the scalability of your cluster. Um, so it's even more reason to make sure you get your cluster configured correctly the first time, um, because ultimately, when you do run into issues, you don't want to be spending time um, tracing back to what was the root cause. And it's often hard because the first overt symptom um, is, is often not correlated with the root cause of the, the issue. Uh, and we'll talk more into into that um, on the, the preceding slides. To take advantage of the parallel processing that Hadoop provides, we need to provide, we need to express our query as a MapReduce job. And MapReduce works by breaking the processing into two phases, the map phase and the reduce phase. Each phase has key value pairs as um, input and output. So as you can see from this example, we're starting from the left here. So um, we have a, a text file of, um, of cities in Oregon. So we have Eugene, Salem, Beaverton, Portland, Salem, Salem, Beaverton, Eugene, Portland. And what word count does is it takes this text file and it counts for you. You know, how many times does Eugene show up in this file? How many times does Beaverton show up in this file, et cetera? Um, so from um, going from the left to the right, um, your, your first step is to split. So you're splitting. Um, your, your text file into, into different lines, right? So you've got these two, three distinct lines. From there, you start the mapping phase where you're, you're breaking each line into a key value pair. So um, Eugene is the key, one is the value. Salem is the key, one is value, and so forth. From there, you go into shuffling where you're grouping like-minded together. So all of the Eugenes go together, all the Salems go together, and, and et cetera. Um, and then on to reducing, where you're, you're doing the counting part, right? Where um, you look and you see in this file, you have two Eugenes. So you, um, again, key value pair, right? Eugene is the key, two is the value in this case. Um, and finally, um, you, know, you have a, a sorted list um, listing the word count of each city from this text file. The agenda for today, we're going to talk about First, we're going to set the stage, you know, why do we even care about misconfigurations? And often people, when they hear misconfigurations, they think, well, it's probably something for performance, tuning, or, you know, I worry about it when I have, like, large jobs, um, and, you know, I want to make sure I have enough um, capacity, et cetera. But actually, it, 
It just so happens that if you have a misconfiguration, you will get failed jobs. You can bring your cluster to its knees with a, a somewhat simple misconfiguration. The hard part is figuring out which misconfiguration broke your cluster. And the best way to not be in that situation is to correctly configure your cluster the first time. And so we're going to talk about some of the more common misconfigurations um, and hopefully avert a lot of those, those needless hours spent figuring out what went wrong. Even though the bulk of our tickets that we're going to talk about, the issues rather that we're going to talk about will be with MapReduce, it's, it's not that there are no misconfigurations with the other components in the Hadoop ecosystem, of which there are 13 or so. Um, the reason I'm going to stress MapReduce specifically is because MapReduce is central to the system. And we've discovered that even, say, if you have a Hive job. So Hive is, is a SQL-like syntax that you can use instead of writing MapReduce jobs in Java. Um, so by using Hive, you just use syntax like queries, uh, which will then spawn a MapReduce job on your behalf. Um, so we've, we've discovered um, Hive jobs that failed because of a faulty misconfig on MapReduce. Um, and we'll talk more in detail um, on the, the preceding slides. As you can see from this graph, the, the bulk of the time we've spent debugging issues has been, in both time and tickets, has been with MapReduce. And this isn't to say that, uh, you know, the other some, the other um, components in the Hadoop ecosystem are, are less buggy or, or less um, misconfiguration prone. Um, on the contrary, some more, um, some less mature systems like Hive and Pig, we might see more bugs, right, rather than misconfigurations. But um, MapReduce is central to the system, therefore it's the hardest to configure. There are just so many knobs um, in HTFS side, in MapRed side, in Core side. There's so many different knobs you need to tweak. And not only that, but if you tweak one knob, you better make sure you tweak the other knob too because they are dependent. And it's hard um, as, as you know, a new administrator to a Hadoop cluster, it's hard to immediately know intuitively, well, which are the parameters that are dependent on each other. And, and we'll see examples where um, the heap source or the heap size was increased and then the map buffer was not subsequently increased. And as a result, there were job failures on Hive. What are misconfigurations? Misconfigurations are any issues requiring a change to the Hadoop config file, so this is core site, HDFS site, MapRed site, or to the OS config files. And as you can see from this graph, the bulk of our tickets and our time is spent on misconfigurations. Um, when we've done root cause analysis and postmortems on support tickets, we've really um, discovered across the board, this isn't just one customer, this is all of our customers looking at it um, over a statistically sound um, sample that you know, it's really important to focus on misconfigurations um, because you know, the, due to the 80-20 rule, right, you want to spend most of your time um, on the issues that pop up the most. If your cluster is broken, chances are it's a misconfiguration. When I tell this to people, they don't believe me, and, and I don't blame them. Um, you know, most of the time, for, for other, sim, uh, other sim systems, other um, enterprise systems, you know, often it's a bug, it's not a misconfiguration. But Hadoop, for all of its benefits, it's not there yet. It's not a mature system yet. And this is why we need the community to help make it more mature, um, to, to make the documentation more robust. Um, to, to make the API more user-friendly, et cetera. But in the meantime, we care about misconfigurations because it contributes to broken clusters. If you're oversubscribing your cluster, specifically if you're running a MapReduce job um, with a Hive job, you're oversubscribed, you're going to see failures. Um, and they're going to be nasty, brutish, and short. This is um, an error message we got when a customer upgraded their Hadoop cluster and previously working Hive jobs suddenly started failing right and left. And they had no idea what happened because um, in their eyes, all they did was upgrade and they didn't even want to upgrade. We told them to upgrade because it would be good for them and look what happened. And, and uh, you know, shortly afterwards, I had a very angry customer over the weekend trying to figure out what went wrong with these Hive jobs. And this was all I had to go off of. Um, I had a return error code too. And from that, I needed to deduce you know, what went wrong. It turns out that 
the shuffle phase for the query, so you remember from our word count example, the shuffle phase came in between the map phase and, and the reduce phase. Um, and that was really key to, to figuring out the puzzle. Um, there are so many mis, sorry, there's so many configurations, um, so many knobs you can tune in Hadoop. If you can't narrow it down, it's just um, this relentless game of cat and mouse where you're tweaking something um, and you hope it'll work and then it doesn't and you tweak something else and it's, it seems almost mindless after, after a point. But if you can pin down which phase your query is failing in, then you can zero in on a subset of configurations to tweak as a result. Um, so in this case, um, what ultimately helped us figure out what was going on was they had um, a successful job.xml file that we compared with a failed dot job, a failed job.xml file. So job.xml files are basically a core dump of all of the Hadoop configurations um, you've, you're using for that job. So these could be config settings that you set on the command line or config settings from the core site file, the HDFS um, site file, et cetera. So these are all of the, the configs that you use for that particular job. Um, so it was, it was literally trial and error. Um, I looked at the two XML files, the two job XML files, um, and just compared, you know, where, where was it different? Um, and it turns out there were six um, configuration settings that were different, um, and ultimately the culprit was the heap, the child heap had been increased um, during the upgrade. They had just figured, you know what, let's just add more heap to the child Java ops. But the map buffer size had not been increased um, and these two, uh, we'll talk about later, but they have a relationship, and that relationship needs to be honored, otherwise you will see job failures like this. So during the shuffle phase, each map task has a circular memory buffer that it writes the output to. The buffer by default is 100 megs, um, and it's a size that can be tuned by changing the IO store MB property. When the contents of the buffer reach a certain threshold size, a background thread will start to spill the contents to disk. Map outputs will continue to be written to the buffer while the spill takes place, but if the buffer fills up during that time, the map will block until the spill is complete. In this case, increasing the ILSOR MB, the map buffer size, helped the sorting phase by doing fewer disk spills. But again, this is not intu intuitive. Looking at that original error message, which was a return code too, um, it's, it's very hard to go from that and to, to deduce that, oh, I didn't increase my map buffer size accordingly. Um, so all the more reason to make sure you configure it correctly the first time, because later on, you don't want to be scratching your head over the weekend trying to figure out um, and piece together, like Sherlock Holmes, what went wrong when. It's a good segue into our first mismanagement topic, memory. You know, it would have been nice if I had gotten this error message instead of the, the return code too, but that's a different topic for a different session. In this case, if you're seeing this out of memory error, um, it, it's most likely you have a memory leak somewhere. Um, you don't have memory configured correctly somewhere. Um, and as I mentioned, um, you, want to, you want to set your, your map buffer size to be between a quarter and a half of your child heap size. You know, this is something that we've consistently seen across diverse clusters that has worked well. That said, um, it obviously should be overridden per job as needed. Um, if, if you're running a particular job, you may need um, to allocate more or less uh, map buffer um, as a result. Um, you know, this is more reason why, besides just making, your sh making sure you configure things correctly, you wanna make sure that you're doing monitoring. So um, there are several tools out there, one of which is Clutter Manager that can help you um, figure out is your failure occurring in the shuffle phase? And if so, you know, what configs should you be looking at, right? There's so many configs, where do you start? Um, you, you need um, to monitor your, your Hadoop cluster um, in order to pinpoint failures like this and, and to allocate your time accordingly. Um, you know, other issues that could cause this out of memory error, it could be that your path names are too long. Uh, we've seen instances where um, customers had um, instead of the, using the best practice of just slash data slash one, you know, they had this, these incredibly long path names um, that were eating into their memory. Um, and, and nobody realized that, that you know, these path names were actually eating up their memory accordingly. One of our, our Cloudera engineers, Todd Lipkin, said it best when he tweeted, if the sum of your max heap size 
exceeds your physical RAM minus three gigabytes, go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200. And we've seen time and time again where um, users have, have gotten these error messages about out of memory, and they just, they just go crazy, and they just start increasing their data node heap, and then they increase, for good measure, their cache tracker heap, and for good measure, they increase some other things too. But forgetting that, at the end of the day, it needs to add up to your total RAM. Um, and, and if not, you, know, you will see errors, um, and it's best to, to remember, you know, as you increase things, um, that has consequences on other parameters as well. Another out-of-memory error could occur in your job tracker. Um, if you're seeing these out-of-memory errors on your job tracker, most likely your, your tasks are too small and you're keeping too much job history around. Um, before you start tweaking anything, it's, it's best to, to run a JMAP. Um, analysis, and that way you get a nice histogram of what objects the JVM has allocated, because you can't improve what you can't measure, right? So it's important to first measure um, where are you allocating your memory, um, and then you can uh, improve, increase, decrease, tweak, go from there, and know for certain uh, whether or not you're, you're improving um, your memory usage or not. By default, the job tracker keeps 100 jobs per user. So this is kind of um, a holdover from, from the previous days, the early days, I would say, where you probably had everyone running jobs um, as the same user, right? Security was not an issue. Um, everybody ran as a Hadoop user. Um, and you, know, you probably had a proof of concept going. So it, it didn't really matter, right? And so you, know, you want to keep all these jobs around for easy debugging. Um, and so the default was set at 100 jobs. But now with with uh, multiple users using the same cluster, you can see how very quickly this can add up. If you have, um, say, 100 users, and if you're keeping the default and saving 100 jobs per user, that can very quickly exceed um, any heap you have allocated for your job tracker. And, and as a result, um, we, we recommend decreasing that default 100 to five. So set your complete user jobs to to a maximum of five. And so um, this actually does not affect um, your ability to, to debug um, because it doesn't mean that you know, the rest of jobs are deleted. They're just allocated and held elsewhere in memory. So you're not using up your job tracker memory. So you know, your, your ability to debug failed jobs is not um, affected. Um, the only thing that is, is affected um, in a good way is you're using less RAM on your job tracker. So you're less likely to see the out of memory errors. Finally, um, our last most common memory mismanagement issue, misconfiguration, is with native threads. Um, so if you're seeing these unable to create new native thread or too many open file issues, it, it, it could manifest as your data node showing up as dead, even though processes are still running on those machines. Um, so in this case, you're going to need to change your, your OS settings, your OS configs rather than your Hadoop configs, and, and increase um, your settings for open files, processes, max memory. Um, we recommend um, 64K and up. Um, I've gotten the question, well, why not just fix that, right? Um, just, you know, if you know it's an issue, instead of just telling people to fix it, why not just fix it yourself? Um, the reason is twofold. One, these are not static defaults. Two, these are not Hadoop defaults, but OS defaults. Um, and I'm sure a lot of um, sysadmins will not be very happy if, if we're going around tweaking these OS settings accordingly. On to thread mismanagement. First up is fetch failures. As you remember from our, our previous uh, word count slide, this is the same word count slide, but this time we're going to focus on just the shuffle phase. So this is where the fetch failures occur, um, where in between the map reduce, this is basically when um, you're not able to, to um, fetch. The reducers are not able to fetch the output from the mappers for a variety of reasons. And Fetch failures, I've worked at Cloudera for two years. Um, I first started debugging fetch failure issues when I started. I am still debugging fetch failure issues today. And the reason for that is because fetch failures can be caused by a hardware issue. You know, maybe you have a corrupt uh, disk. Um, it could be a misconfiguration. It could be a jetty bug. It could be all of the above. Um, and, and we'll go into more detail later. But um, to understand fetch failures, we need to first understand the reduce phase. The reduce phase is composed of three steps, the copy, the sort, also known as the merge, and the reduce. 
During the copy phase, the reducer fetches the map output from the task tracker and stores it on the reducer in memory or on disk. The reduced tasks have to fetch the map outputs a map outputs from the remote servers, of which there may be many thousands. Fetch failures occur when reducer fetch operations fail to retrieve mapper outputs. Um, we, have, we have seen this occur with, with customers where um, they had first one node, one single node out of their cluster of 100 or so nodes um, succumb to fetch failures. And they saw hundreds of their mappers failing from too many fetch failures. Um, then, like the thundering herd, um, because that one host got blacklist, blacklisted, um, it then shifted to another node, um, which then had to rerun all those failed jobs. Um, and as you can imagine, that caused a, quite a delay, um, a delay of tens of hours. Um, and so, even though the fetch failure warning, when you see it in your log file, it's, it looks like a very innocuous info. And you think, oh, it's an info. I have warrants to worry about. I have errors to worry about. I have fatals to worry about. I don't have all day to worry about infos. And, and you ignore infos. But do not ignore this info. This info is deadly. Um, and it could not just delay your jobs by tens of hours, but it will do that to each node in your cluster until your entire cluster is brought to its knees because of this innocuous sounding info message. But what causes this so-called info message? It could be DNS issues, so it could be networking issues. Um, it could be a misconfiguration in that you don't have enough HTTP threads on your mapper side. It could be a JVM bug, um, a Jetty bug. You know, we've seen all of the above um, with, with many of our customers. Um, and, and it's an issue that continues to rise specifically because um, the root cause is very uh, varied. So this is a, a recommended best practice of, you know, when you're seeing these misconfigs, you've ruled out the DNS issues, you've ruled out um, hardware issues. Um, you know, these are the, the misconfigurations, rather the configurations you should look into tweaking if you're seeing this and you've ruled out um, a lot of the hardware and networking issues. The map output is fetched by the reducers from the task trackers via HTTP, and so by, um, by um, increasing the task tracker HTTP threads, you're increasing the number of threads um, that can be used to serve map output. Um, the reduced tasks have to fetch the map outputs from the remote servers, um, of which there could be thousands. So you want this copy process to be able to run in parallel, um, and as a result, uh, what we recommend is setting your parallel copies to the square root of the node count with a floor of 10. So you can increase the number of parallel copies used by reducers to retrieve to fetch map output. Um, and, and also, we want to allow reducers from other jobs to be able to run while a big job waits on mappers. And this is the rationale behind um, increasing the slow start to, to 0.8. Um, finally, um, if you're using the, the version 6126 of Jetty, it's fetch failure prone. Um, we have several JIRAs, um, upstream JIRAs that um, discuss that in more detail if you're interested. Um, but if you're seeing these issues, you've already tweaked um, your configs, you've rolled out any hardware issues, um, you know, you should look into what version of Jetty you're running, because it, it could very well be that you're running on, on the, the fetch failure prone Jetty. Um, another, um, another misconfiguration we often see is when you're not able to place enough replicas. Um, and, and what this means is that your, your DFS replication exceeds your number of available data nodes. And it could be that your number of available data nodes is low due to load the space. Um, it could be that your, your map red submit replication is too high. Um, it could be that your name node is unable to satisfy the block pace placement policy. Um, for instance, if, if um, you set your, um, your number of racks to be greater than or equal to two, that means that a block has to exist in at least two racks. Um, and um, it also could be that your data has too much load on it, et cetera. There could be, as you can see, a variety of reasons, um, even more so why it's important to, to configure correctly. Because it's often hard to look at this, this warn, this warning 
message and figure out, well, what caused this, right? As you see, there's a slew of, of reasons that could cause it. And subsequently, there's also a slew of um, things you could do to alleviate it as a result. Um, so it's, it's good to, to check for your disk space, look for nodes that are down, look for racks that are down, um, you know, make sure that this parameter, the Xceivers parameter, is, is spelled wrong. So it accidentally was misspelled. Um, and as a result, you know, people along the way, they have spelled it correctly to their detriment. Um, so it's important to, to honor that typo. Um, you may need to, to rebalance under replicated blocks. Um, and so these are some config settings we found to be useful. Um, you could also just shut down the data node um, and then use the Linux move command um, to move some of your files um, from your, your DFS data dir um, from a full volume to an empty volume. And finally, on to data mismanagement. If you're seeing this no such file directory, um, one of the first things you want to look into is to make sure you have reserved enough space for the temporary data of the biggest Hadoop job expected. Um, so so we've, we recommend allocating roughly 10% of your DFS space to MapReduce. If you're, if you're seeing this error message, um, you know, usually it manifests as jobs are failing, your task tracker is failing to start. Um, it, it could be due to um, your task tracker filling up, and, and that's because you haven't set enough, um, you, know, you haven't reserved enough space for your MapReduce jobs. So it could also be wrong permissions, a bad disk. Um, you know, make sure that your, um, your permissions are um, 755. Um, you know, I, I first gave this, this talk um, at Hadoop Road 2011. Um, and for, for this talk, for ApacheCon, you know, I, I didn't want to just give the same talk, right? Because that would be pointless um, and a disservice to the community. Um, and so I, I started updating it. And, and so this is, I reassure you, um, for anyone who was in that previous talk, this is an update. Um, but what amazed me was how many of these misconfigurations are still running rampant two years later. Um, I'm still seeing in the community, I'm still seeing with our customers, um, the permissions are set wrong. Um, you know, the owner is set wrong. Um, they're, they're running not as map read or, or you know, you're seeing bad disks. So these same error messages I was seeing um, show up. Um, you know, they're still showing up. You know, some of them are not, which is why I removed this from this deck, but um, some of them still are. Um, and so what that tells me is misconfigurations are, are really hard. We need to monitor better. Um, you know, we need to document better. Um, there are a lot of things we need to do better, but you know, being vigilant about configuring it right the first time um, is, is, is key um, to, to not seeing these going forward. Um, and finally, um, a, a final deadly misconfiguration also more commonly known as, as a foobar, as a user error. Um, this actually happened. We had a customer who remained nameless who, who did an RMR, and their Hadoop trash was not configured, and there was permanent data loss, and there was much gnashing of teeth and yelling and pointing, and a lot of boss types got involved. Um, this is very unfortunate because the, by default, your trash is not configured. Um, and, and here are some JIRAs to reference um, if, you, if you want to read about the history behind this. So after this happened, um, there's a lot of talk in the, in the community about, you know, well, should we, should we change it so that trash is no longer um, a user level feature? Should we make it server-side trash, right? And, and I think that's still an ongoing debate. Um, and others also talk about instead of having the default of zero, which means your trash is not configured, so it's actually more of a recycling bin, right? It's more like, well, oops, I didn't mean to do an RMR. Um, let me go and rescue those files. Um, but instead, you know, the, the consensus was like, let's keep it um, at zero. Um, so meaning that if you were to do an RMR, you are going to be seeing permanent data loss um, as a result. What we recommend is um, set it to um, 1,440 minutes, so your content stick around for a day. So, um, you know, in case you do have this user error, um, you know, you can retrieve that. You can go back in time um, and, and get that back. Um, um, so, one bonus misconfig that um, is is not as deadly 
as, as some of the ones I've previously mentioned, right? There's nothing more deadly than losing data. But um, this is something that has, has tripped up um, several of our users where, um, you know, they've, they've gotten this, you know, no groups available for user doctrine. They're all wondering, who is Doctor Who? I don't remember Doctor Who. I don't remember authenticating as Doctor Who. Um, so what we recommend if you see this is, um, you know, what this means is that you have an unauthenticated user, right, who's trying to view job details. So for instance, um, you know, if, if I um, am trying to view, if I'm Kate and I'm trying to view Mark's um, jobs, you know, I'm going to get this error, right, uh, because I, I'm, not, I'm not Mark. I shouldn't be able to view it. But instead of, instead of you know, seeing error message that says, you know, you are not Mark, you're not able to, um, you're going to say, see this, this Doctor Who message. Um, so, you know, you have a couple of options. Um, first, you can just pass that specific user via the URL. Um, so you can just, um, you know, the local host, um, URL, you can just like plop in, you know, user.name equals your name, right? So that's one way to bypass this. Another way is to um, configure Kerberos. Um, and you can also tweak this configuration setting from the, the Doctor Who default as well. One large cluster doesn't necessarily show all the different dependencies. And we've seen a lot of diverse operational clusters. And part of what we do is, is to provide tools that help diagnose and understand how Hadoop operates. Um, you know, if, if you didn't get anything from this talk, um, you know, first these slides will be available, so you know, feel free to reference them. But if you didn't get anything from this talk, or remember the seven deadly misconfigurations, um, what I really want you to take away is misconfigurations are really hard to diagnose. You know, we don't have that documentation in place. We don't have those descriptive, um, detailed error messages in place that tell you, oh, this is where you misconfigured, you know, go tweak that, go increase that, go decrease that. We don't have that yet. Therefore, it's really important to correctly configure it the first time around. Um, and second, um, you know, get it right with monitoring tools. It's, there are a number out there, um, and it's really important to use them. Um, um, you know, for instance, with uh, the leap second bug, I don't know how many of you are affected by it, um, but you know, back in, in May, we got a support ticket from a customer asking, you know, is, is Hadoop going to be affected with the upcoming leap second? And we thought, oh, no, you know, Hadoop has um, automatic failover, and, and Hadoop will be able to take care of that. Um, and, you know, we all fell on our faces at the end of June when a number of our customers, uh, 30 to be exact, all hit the leap second bug all at the same time. Uh, and they were all freaking out because um, they were seeing on a Saturday, um, their cluster running at 100% capacity. They all thought that the clusters were possessed. Um, they were possessed with a bug. And, and in this case, by, by using Clutter Manager, by using Ganglia, they were able to monitor and see that, oh, suddenly our CPU spiked, right? Um, you know, that's something that, that you want to be proactively monitoring um, and, and to know when your cluster is broken, when your jobs are failing. Like, if you start noticing, you know, this node is going down and that node is going down, maybe you want to look into fetch failures. Maybe, you know, there's this thundering herd going on with the fetch failures. Um, but at any rate, um, misconfigs are hard, um, and it's up to you to, to diagnose. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of these issues dealt with map with MapReduce, um, but, um, often, you know, you're going to see these issues with Hive, also with HBase. Um, so a quick plug for HBase Con. Um, call for speakers is up. Early bird registration is up for HBase Con as well. Uh, with that, I'll open up for questions. Don't be shy. Cal, I'll have, I have a question. Yes. Uh, can you enlighten us anything on, you know, uh, some of, I know that on HGFS, uh, the administrator creates quotas for, say, different teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, many, many a times, certain teams are given a lesser quota. Mm -hmm. But is there a more dynamic way that, you know, they can change the quota on the, on the fly or, or for, say, a day or so, something like that on HDFS mm -hmm. so that, you know, the team can use that excessive quota for a day or so. The quota in terms of memory or quota? Yeah, the, the disk usage, the, the disk usage. usage. Um, let's see. There, there could be a, a configuration parameter for that. 
Um, it's not something we commonly see, so I don't have a good answer for you right off the top of my head, but um, I can I can look into it. There are so many knobs to tweak, I, so. I don't think that exists. You don't think that exists? No. Um, well, there you have it. No, just kidding. Um, let, let me, uh, let me um, yeah, I, not that I doubt you, Ryan. Um, it is Ryan. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, not that I doubt you, Ryan, but let me, let me look into that. I, I would doubt me. But it probably doesn't exist based on what I've seen. Is it something that we can hack? Something you can what? We can, like, code. Uh, is, do we have uh, a way we can define strategies for uh, giving quotas on SJSS? Yeah. Anything can be coded. Patches are welcome. That's kind of the standard open source answer. <laughs> Mark. So is there something better we can do to actually document these configurations? Because I'm guessing a lot of people run into these and they end up Google searching and sometimes they will find it and sometimes they won't. But do you have any particular right. thoughts on, I mean, how can we make the community better around who uh, do projects to, um, to make this information proactively available to people so they don't run into it, waste a lot of time figuring out what it is and trying to fix it? Right, right, so that's a great question, Mark. So Mark asks, is there a way to, to proactively um, tell people about these means configurations? Um, and the answer is, is, is twofold, um, Cloudera Manager. So as, as I've seen these, um, as I've, I've seen, as I've run into these misconfigurations, um, I've, I've passed that and fed that information to our Cloudera Manager team. And so with Cloudera Manager, um, the, the defaults are right. Because um, right now, if you were to just install Hadoop out of the box, you would run into these issues because um, the defaults are not suited um, for, for running a Hadoop cluster right out of the box without tweaking. But Cloudera Manager is. Um, all of these, these configs I fed back to the Cloudera Manager team. So the defaults with Cloudera Manager are right the first time. Um, that said, um, in terms of more, more proactiveness, um, you know, there's, these slides will be made available. Um, and I've seen people on the user mailing list um, reference um, this deck from the, the Hadoop World um, conference. Um, so you know, this is something I, I don't intend to hoard any of this knowledge. This is some, some knowledge that I've, I've gleaned from looking at a diverse set of clusters. So one large cluster isn't necessarily going to show you all of the, the, the misconfigurations. Um, it's only by looking at a diverse set of clusters with a diverse workflow and many different use cases that you're going to see these misconfigurations, you're going to spot these patterns as well. Um, so, so this will definitely be made available. Um, you know, Caldera, Caldera Manager is also freely available as well. Yes? Why is it that I also have MD? When it's small, why, why is the code broken? I mean, when the bubble is small, we should still be able to do the job, right? Even if the bubble is small, well, what's the reason? Right, right. So the question is, um, why is it that a small map buffer size um, you know, cause a hive job to fail, um, and so uh, you know that answer is multifold. You know, one, um, it it could very well be that um, underneath the misconfiguration, what I do know is this: um, when I increased the the sort buffer, um, sorry, the map buffer, uh, the job worked. You know, I didn't tweak anything else; I just tweaked this one parameter, and it worked. Um, you know, but that said, by digging into the theory behind it, why would that cause it? Um, there could be underlying bug, for all I know, uh, where this misconfiguration is masking a bug. Um, but you know, it, it, another reason could be that um, because you know, what you're doing is, um, so let me just go back to, to that slide. Um, I think it was pretty early on. Let's see, where was it? Um, so by, by increasing the IL sort MB, the map buffer size, um, we help the sorting phase by doing fewer um, dispels. And so um, when, when you do a dispel, the map thread will block. Um, so you know, this, is, this is what I'm guessing here. Like I, I understand. Like when, I, when I analyzed this further, I kind of thought, you know, could it really be that, that just, you know, because it should have still worked. You know, there might have been some performance issues. Maybe it, it should have been, um, you know, it may have maybe taken a much longer time, but the job should still, in theory, should have still succeeded, even with um, a low map buffer size. Um, so, so my theory behind this, and looking into this more, is that um, it, it could be that, you know, this was an especially long query. You know, I, I can't show you the query um, due to co customer confidential data, but um, it literally took up, if I were to show you the query, it would literally take up the whole page. Um, so it could just be that um, the size of the query caused too many map threads to block. 
uh, which then caused the shuffle phase to, to fail. Um, so you know, I'm not saying that when you have a completely configured, correctly configured cluster, you're never going to run into any issues, but it will definitely decrease a lot of it. all the slides from the speakers and Apache Gaon should be okay. posting it sometime. We, we are uh, collecting these slides and Apache Gaon should be posting it sometime. Just out of curiosity yeah. on the issue that you saw here, uh, what was the data a binary comparable or it was just a writable comparable for which needed that uh, not the record to be read off, read off the memory to an, an object. Um, I don't because you are tracking an out of memory er error here, right? Right, right. So I don't quite remember. Um, what I do remember from from this was, um, you know, there was another query that failed on this um, on this cluster. That was due to um, some compression codex. Um, but as as to the further details, um, I, I I don't quite remember. But we can talk offline. 